biggest thing is the ability to make an impact. From that moment onwards, we moved from being a brand that advertised to a brand that communicated. We collaborate with our clients and over time we try and get them to fire us. You must have to have really difficult conversations. I want to see no office wall. I want to see everything covered in ideas. There's so much data available that you can kind of get dazzled by it. And I have What the hell are you doing? <laughs> Hello, my name's Katie Sando and welcome to the Marketing Forum podcast, where we learn about the professional world of brilliant marketers, communicators and creatives. Alex Murphy is head of marketing for the Admiral Group. And in this episode, he joins me to chat through all things marketing and insurance. Don't let that put you off, though. It is actually mainly about marketing. From how he's built and structured the team at Admiral to developing campaigns, Alex is an incredible marketer. I learned so much just from talking with him and I really hope you enjoy our conversation as much as I did. Uh, our day to day, well, my day to day changes day to day. So it is, it is quite dramatically different from each day. So, uh, this morning might, we might be talking about a loyalty program yesterday. We were talking about what we want to do with the website next and what technology we want to use. Uh, the day before we were talking about plans around customer experience. It, it changes every single day. I doubt I've had two days the same. Uh, You've got quite so, a big team, haven't you? Yeah. So it's 45 of us, I believe. So it's quite a large department. It's the largest market department I've worked in. And so, so yeah, it's, and, and I suppose for South Wales as well, it's, it's quite large. Uh, but then Admiral's one of the biggest brands in South Wales as well. So, so You I can see the building, good. can't you? When you go into, whenever I go into Cardiff, I'm always like, it's the Admiral building. Yeah, it's a, it's a lovely building. It's a nice place to work as well, actually, in terms of the, obviously the place. Admiral's a good place to work, but the building is a nice building to work in. Not that I know, I've been there three times in the last 18 months, but yeah. <laughs> you hear it's nice. Um, it. Tell me how that team's structured then. So that structured, so within that, presumably you've got marketing, you've got advertising as well. Yeah, so there's five teams. And, and they, when I start, I started there four years ago. And when I arrived, you know, great team, already very skilled people there. And, and a lot of those skilled people are still there. Uh, what I found was there were sort of overlaps by purpose. So two teams might be trying to do roughly the same thing. Right. Uh, a classic one that comes up time and time again, it came up when I worked in my previous role in, in GoCompare as well, is the whole digital marketing, sort of e commerce type roles versus brand and versus advertising. But the weird thing is you'll have people who will, who will have a £3 million budget for advertising TV but then you'll have the, the digital marketing guys who can't scrape 20 grand together to do an experiment or a test. And so they got to move forward. So one of the first things I did was merge certain teams by their purpose. So growth, for example, is the advertising team, although they advertise a lot to existing customers. Then so you've got a brand team, an advertising team, an ECRM team, which is all about communicating with existing customers. We've got an optimization team and they uh they do as you'd expect, they optimize, although every channel optimizes itself. They they look at dashboards, they look at performance and data. They also are responsible for all the A-B testing that we do. And then we have sort of a partnerships and product team. So within Admiral, we're very famous for motor insurance and more increasingly so for home insurance. But we also sell pet insurance, travel insurance, and, and a bunch of other things. But though what's quite hard in the marketing department is to spare the time for some of those newer products and to yeah. give them the air to, to grow and focus to grow. And you often need more focus than the money behind them uh, and the money they make. So, so the product team sort of supports them as a sort of almost consultancy in a way. And so does merging teams like that mean that you, maybe your approach is more integrated within a problem? So your solution, so you said like growth. So does that mean you've got the ability to do, um, you know, advertising, but integrate digital as part of that? Yeah. So, so the advertising team is your job is advertising. And within that, we'll run PPC, TV, radio, whatever. Uh, even every, every, everyone says, oh, you shouldn't have any silos. Everyone works like their own little unit, right? You know, the ECRM team are their own little family and mm. got a shared WhatsApp. And, they, you know, <laughs> and that's nice. That's a, that's a little group of six people within the 40 odd, you know, and that's good. That's not a bad thing, but what they do is often quite intrinsically linked with something they might be doing in brand, for example, particularly the stuff that happens in product or loyalty, very tied to ECRM. And 
So I don't force it, but they naturally, by, by the fact that everyone's got a job to do at a purpose, they, it sort of breaks down the silos because everyone needs each other. To sure. Agree. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense doing it that way. Um, I, I saw somewhere actually uh, that you'd mentioned um, sort of embedding creative as well. Um, yes. Is that, is that something that you've proactively sought to do at Admiral? No, so I'm, I was very fortunate when I arrived that uh, within the brand team, we have the studio and the studio is a few designers and a few developers. So we have lots of developers. We have a very large IT department in Admiral, but these are distinct. They are marketing developers and they work on building pages. They'll work on building content for SEO purposes and also just for um, customer engagement purposes. So, uh, yeah, so that studio existed when I arrived. Like I said, there was a lot of, I was very lucky to, to take on a, a very uh talented department so uh yeah the, we have designers we have even different types of designers we have a few ux people we have straightforward designers we have a talented video and 3d designers so it sounds like loads but it's about six people in design and about five or six people in in dev it's not you know tons of people but we're lucky to have it it's it quite agile there's a really interesting article in mckinsey quite a while ago now like definitely not this year definitely last year and they were talking about how um, businesses should use creatives more to solve general business problems, because the yeah. whole point of a creative approach is that, you know, you might not be, you might not specialize in, I don't know, this particular issue, but if you're able to come in with a creative approach, you're more likely to have a problem solving mindset. Uh, Can you? I couldn't, I couldn't agree more. So I, I did. So people bash about the term design thinking a lot. Mm. And I've said it myself, and I've gone, actually, I've never been trained in design thinking. And also, everyone, because you're a marketer, everyone thinks you're just this amazingly creative person. And you're <laughs> going to just throw ideas out. I can't. Actually, I'm, I'm really, I'm not that great. You're just going, oh, what about this? And what about this? And what about this? I work with people who are absolutely like that. But I'm, I'm a bit more process-led in the way I think about things. So last year, I did a course with INSEAD, and it, I, taught, I got taught over a few months design thinking properly, properly, properly. And uh, I've got this on my desk, which is workshop tactics, you know, and it's just like a little thing. And, and I, I'm not sponsored, by the way, <laughs> um, but, but it's, it's, it's just because there's so many cool little tricks yeah. that, that we need because we get into this rigid thinking. Whereas designers who even from once they decide they want to be in art or whatever, so design or, or product design or whatever, they very much think in that way naturally for suits. It's quite hard. Mm. You know, yeah, you think very linearly, whereas they quite easily can go, ba 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 ba. And what about this? Okay, take that idea and rip it up and do this. So I think we need to train ourselves into doing that. But it's fun when you do it. It's mm. hard. It's really hard. Uh, but once you break yourself a little bit, it, it's fascinating and, and really fun. I'm yeah. doing a design thinking course next year. I was supposed to do it this year, but it's with the Inst European Institute of Design. So it's in Barcelona. Right. Um, mm. So I've had to delay it for two years. But I'm dead excited because I'm the same oh, as you. So like, good. it's one of those things where it's, so it's design thinking for business transformation. So it's exactly yeah. that sweet spot of how do we think mm. in this? But I'm the same as you, like no formal experience of design thinking at all. But you just hear about it a lot, don't you? Yeah. And I'm working with our product team. So we have a product team for each, each product and I'm teaching them design thinking now. And it's so fun teaching it as well. I'm, I'm obviously I'm nowhere near the quality of the professors that I was taught by, but it, just going, okay, forget all that. And I'll go, what's your best idea? Give us all your best ideas. And everyone trots out the same ideas. And I go, right, you can't use any of those. Go again. And they go, what? I'm not allowed to use any of those. And, and just really breaking people and going, no, you can't do that. Okay, take that. Now, what if it was made of cardboard? You know, <laughs> and, and then just yeah. stuff. And what is the worst, what is the stupidest thing you could do right now? Okay, what does that look like? And I find that fascinating, but that's relatively new to us, to outside of the design team. Mm. But it is fascinating. I'm sure you'll enjoy the course. I know. Uh, I can't we, wait. We about it because uh, I I I really liked it, and I like teaching the team. And we, we're going through our stages. You know, the the, the difference is a problem statement onwards, and uh, but I'm halfway through the course, and we, we need to do more of it. You're so going to end up being like a, a a professional trainer now. 
I know I could. I'd love to do that. My mum always wanted me to be a teacher. So maybe I should, maybe I should call it. And then you will be sponsored and you'll be product placing. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Everyone should buy this. <laughs> so one of the things um, that you I saw that you said was that um, you started out as a digital marketer and that then, um, and you know, I, I think you smaller organisations, maybe SME, but you said that when you started working, obviously for like a household name, a household brand, that that required quite a mindset shift for you. Mm. And I'm really interested to understand like what you meant by that. Uh, okay. Well, I'll try and avoid um, doing this as your life, but it probably helps to give a little bit of context. Yes, so please. I, I mucked around too much in university and walked out with a tutu. So none of the all advertising, um, None of the advertising agencies I wanted to go and work with in London would touch me with a barge pole back in the day. And so I went to South America to work for a little bit because my father lived there. Uh, and then when I, came, when I came back, a girl I knew was working for a web development agency. And she said, oh, can you code? I went, yeah. <laughs> Couldn't at all. Uh, managed to blag the job. And I worked there for a few years, a company called CDSM in Swansea. And they were great, but did, I, I learned all... I had to build websites, how they all work, what, what makes good usability. Accessibility was a huge thing for them, you know, and, and with visually visual impaired users and, and just proper usability and all that stuff, so, or consumer behavior wise. And then I got an opportunity to get a marketing manager's job in Cardiff. So I went from like not getting any marketing jobs straight into a marketing manager's job, but I was the only marketer there. So it was a bit of a grand title. Yeah, just, but that's classic you know, for SMEs, isn't it? Yeah, right. You're, you're director of marketing. All right, okay. Uh, what am I directing? <laughs> Yes, I've got to look at my textbooks. I've got to read my text, old textbooks with me. I was like, okay, I just need to look at page 53 to how to do that. <laughs> uh, and I, did, I wasn't good at the job, in all honesty. Um, I think my, my, my boss, his company is growing, and he wanted a marketer. I knew he needed a marketing guy, but he didn't know what one was supposed to do. And I'd never been one, mm. so I didn't know what to do. And I did everything from d- driving around with leaflets to faxing all of... Um, What's the what's Chamber of Commerce uh, mailing list? Faxed every single one of them. There's like two thousand people on it. Faxed oh them all. Um, For yeah, younger weird audiences, stuff. <laughs> do a weird fax stuff. machine. You know, yeah. we, we, I was it was a it was a letting agency in Cardiff, and I always remember. But you you're a bit more experimental because you go, God, I don't know what the hell I'm going to do here, and because you're not constrained by well, first we will do a PPC campaign, then we will sort out our SEO and go through the color by numbers of marketing. You go, well, what if I when you knew me and people used to pull up, put like print A4 sheet up and take a rip, rip a piece of paper off for the phone number. So I, I stuck those in all the offices. In fact, the first time I went to Admiral where I work now is I went into their offices and stuck these in the cork boards, you know, and, and you, so you get quite creative that way because you just find what crazy yeah. stuff you can do. Um, and I think what does happen, and then I worked from there and then I worked slowly, big and big companies, went back to be a marketing director and a, and a quite a small startup, but quite, you know, dynamic and proper money, like a proper business, but small. And I think what you've got to be very careful of is that you don't lose that desire to experiment because it is really easy, especially when you get into like a machine because because my marketing department is, they're a fantastic machine. But then even, even when you're responsible for the machine, you're scared of mucking it up. You know, you don't want to change things too much because it's all gone well. You know, you're sending out hundreds of, millions of emails a year and 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 you you're responsible for a budget of whatever million and you go oh we could do something a bit mad but everything's okay so maybe not and and you, i do my door's gonna slam there in a second because the wind um you do but but it, it's hard to remember that it's easy to play safe and and you don't really get fired for playing safe but there is a fear you get fired if you do something mental and it goes wrong and uh and and so that's that's the a big mindset change uh is that you've got to keep that up but you've also got to bear in mind that you're responsible for a brand now and and it's not my brand it's mm. it's it's it was 30 years before me and, and tens and tens and tens of millions of hours of of time yeah in it, and thousands of people rely on it so you've got all that responsibility but at the same time you've got to keep sharp you've got to keep pushing it Oh, it's so interesting because obviously I wanted to talk to you a bit about like the difference then in your experience of having done that, you know, SME 
what skills you build as an SME marketer, but then, you know, contrast that with then much more corporate experience. Mm. And brand is such an interesting one in that, because like you say, you're, you're almost a guardian for it in a big corporate, whereas in an SME, because you tend to be quite close to the brand, yeah. you can seriously influence um, and control it. I, when, you, when you're a small brand, you know what you're about, generally, because you, you know really everyone in the company. And you, I'm bearing in mind, I've worked for universities, which were huge things, I didn't know half of them. But then I worked for a company called Source in Panath, which is 70 people, you know, um, even go compare, which is this enormous brand. It's only at the time I was there, it was only 150, 160 people, you know? So in some ways, you know very much what your purpose is and what you're all about. And I, I do a very bad job of, of paraphrase, paraphrasing, um, I can't even say paraphrasing, that's how bad it is, um, Simon Sinek uh, and the, the start with why. But when you go to a big brand, your brand decision that is, is going, hold on, what, this huge thing, what are we actually trying to do here? Aside from make money, obviously, and keep everyone in their jobs. What, what's the purpose? So when I started in Admiral, I found that much harder. And the, you know, we were, everyone knew um, about, knew of Admiral, but no one knew really about us. So actually I started an 18 month sort of, I didn't expect it to take that long at the time. I think we, we said, well, we need to do something about this. So not a rebranding, but almost, understanding what the brand was uh, a brand positioning piece and it wasn't actually saying right we're going to be this now it's going to be okay what actually are we and let's tell everyone uh because and that was fascinating so the brand skills are you really have to really understand what you per- what were you trying to achieve because otherwise you can't it, it just speeds things up then you go through all that process and then when someone goes oh would we do this partnership you go no that's not us like <laughs> But previously, um, my, my head of brand is called Paul Alliance, and she's been an admiral f- since it started pretty much. Okay. Just, just yet. And like a lot of people, when you get, they've been in business, like she's just constantly striving to do something different, something more. And, and it's, it's amazing working with her. But so she knows the brand completely innately. Mm-hmm. So if we say, if I say I could always use her and go, Paula, what do we do this? She goes, no, you know? Because she's been a guardian of the brand for so yeah. long. But that's not codified. That's, no. And no one else can. She can't be there all the time. And you, the people like that have got better time to do than be the brand police. And that's unfortunately what a lot of companies become. They become the brand police. And they go, oh, you don't do that. Don't, don't use the logo this way. And, and, and it's so much more than that. Mm. Um, and then when you get it right, and then I take Admiral, for example. We did Rewardingly Simple. We all bought into it. Actually, the internal positioning is simply more, but we call it Rewardingly Simple on the TV and stuff. Uh, Last year, when we had to make a decision about what to do with the pandemic, we had 20 ideas. We knew that there was a surplus of, of, of money because of the lack of claims, because of the lack of driving. We knew we couldn't, we didn't want to keep it all. We didn't think it was right. Most insurers did, but we decided that wasn't the appropriate thing to do. But we, we had so many different ideas of what we wanted to do with it, how we could do it. Should it all go to charity or should it do this? Should we apportion it this way? Should we be based on X, Y, Z? And we said, no, that's not simple enough. You know, it's not giving the customers back what they need enough. And so then we came up with actually a relatively simple thing, which is the £25 per vehicle. It's actually a really, really simple idea, Mm. but it was huge. And it was probably the thing I'm most proud of ever worked on. But it all came back. It was true to the brand. It was rewarding. It was simple. Um, So when that happens, that's when you've done it. Yeah. You just almost hear the click, don't you? Yeah. Someone goes, oh, someone says to you, "Mm, is that rewardingly simple enough? You're like, oh. That's a, that's a 110 million pound decision you know based on brand positioning so tell me so, about with that so did that um initiative so obviously you guys were in control of thinking about how do we what do we do with this like how do we turn it into something did that initiative come through like the board to say we know we want to do something with this or yes it-, it came from right from the top from the ceo just like what are we going to do Okay. You know, how are we going to approach it? And then we had the motor, because it was a motor situation, the motor product team led on it and did fantastic work. And they went, okay, we think that we can feasibly, because you can want to do lots of things, but some things are just technically impossible. You know, uh, we can feasibly do these things. This is how much money we think it is. 
Uh, and that was a moving feast all the time because you didn't know how long things were going to last. You didn't know how bad things were going to get. We were all thinking it was going to last 12 weeks. We? So, I know. And, um, and so, so there was all, they were doing all the fantastic work there. And then they were coming to us for ideas and other parts of the business for ideas. And, you know, there's no monopoly in ideas and marketing. So we had a bunch of ideas. Other people had a bunch of ideas. And then we went through them and vetted them. Mm. At the same time, we'd use, we were watching America because America was going through a similar process. So we, on social, were observing the responses to Geico's initiative, Allstate's initiative, and who was being well-respected for how they approached it there. So, and, you know, Geico were doing some kind of Geico bucks thing. And everyone's like, oh, this is just a ripoff. And Allstate did um, something per premium. But then we're like, well, that means the people who were the least money were getting disadvantaged. And, and, and it, it, so we observed all that and fed yeah. all that in until we came to a solution. But it was everything, yeah. It's everything. so, it's like you say, I, I totally get like the, not nervousness, but I totally get the kind of weight of it because if you do it wrong, you can get these days on social media and with everything else, it's like lambasting what you can end up getting mm. off the back of it. Yeah. Um, well, imagine you spent 110 million pounds and you're slagged off for it. I know. You know, and you're like, whoa, then I probably wouldn't be having this conversation. I know. <laughs> you know? Well, maybe it'd be a very and, different conversation. Yeah. <laughs> So your new job, <laughs> um, but yeah, so there is that, uh, it, it is frightening. You also, you know, there's a lot of conversation about well, what is everyone else going to do? You know, what, uh, what if they go first? So ironically, if a, a competitor had gone before us and then we'd done it only a few days later, it wouldn't have had a tenth of the impact. No. Because that's the press, right? And that's not the, you know, and, yeah, yeah. and as it happens, someone else did do it. I think a couple of them did kind of a weak version of it that you had to fill in forms and it was all very complicated as I was all automatic. But, uh, and even then they didn't really give it back in the same way. But it was scary because you, you can't, you have to sign off through countless boards. And that's the other thing with a big company versus a small company. There's huge amounts of that. Mm. And as it should be, right? You know, because in small company, you're not often making the decision of that magnitude. Yeah. But so you have to go to the board, you have to write papers. And then, of course, there's always like, what will this do for the brand? Will it be good for the brand? It's like, I can't predict. But of course, yeah. if we believe this is our brand, then we should do this. And actually, yes, it's worked out exceptionally well for us. We're the, the leading brand for consideration now in, in motor insurance. And, but it has all worked out very well for us. But that was always secondary, yeah. uh, which is fantastic. So I suppose, so back to the question around then the SME versus more corporate experience. Would you ever recruit an SME into roles that and um, an SME marketer into roles that you've got, or do you consider that if they don't have experience that's maybe like at a corporate level, mm -hmm. that they would be able to shift across? I don't think it matters at all. Uh, if anything, both both have different advantages. Yeah. SMEs are people. When you know, I speak from experience and from the people I know, you've got to wear about twenty hats. You know. Even, even, even when I work in the Royal Mint, my, my entire digital marketing team, website, PPC, SEO, everything was six people. Yeah. And one, that, one of those was, was, was a lady who ran our live chat. One of the guys was the one who built the website. So it was really all digital marketing was run between me and one other guy. Um, so if you take those skills forward and, and, and you make, you, you're good at it, right? So, so that means that when you land in, in um, a big corporate and you've got one job to do, there is a risk they get bored. Yeah. That is always a risk. Uh, but it, you've got, you're really well equipped, incredibly well equipped. I'm, you know, I, I, will, I, was, I was a marketing director in, in a company and, and I, was, I was like one of two or three marketers total. Yeah. You know? And so you have to wear all that. You have to understand all of the channels. It also makes them really flexible, but also means they empathize. Mm. So if you've only been an email person your whole life, it's very hard for you to empathize with the challenges of a display marketing person or um, PPC to a degree, you know, because you, you, the dynamics of VCRM and uh, email are so different from the dynamics of PPC. PPC is, is, is auctions and trading. It's a completely yeah. different skill set from creative and um, targeting. I mean, mm. it's still targeting, but you know what I mean? It's just totally different things. But if you've done both, you go, okay, well, I can apply this year and this year. And actually, we could both do this together. Um, so that helps a lot. So yeah. no, there's no difference. And, 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 you, and I know you're referring to the question about the differences. 
my job is not different because where I've been, I was responsible for all the marketing. The often, yeah. often I was I was rarely a smaller part of a wide department. So I would normally had quite a broad remit, even if that remit was a marketing department of two. You know, so so me, it's not really changed. But I think if you if if you go from running a, a marketing department, a small marketing, and then going into a single channel, that can just be a bit of a mindset change. And you yeah. want to muck with stuff. You go, oh, I I wouldn't have done that with PPC. And you've got to be a bit more diplomatic. In a way, it's like the dream because it means you can super focus on what you're doing. Whereas like in SME, like you say, you're wearing so many hats, you can get to a point where it's like email done, <laughs> you know, like PPC, let's crack on with that. Um, whereas yeah. if your job then turns into, it's quite focused, it's, but it's really important that it's really right. Mm you know almost that feels like from an SME perspective like what a luxury to be able to just really focus and spend time on that um yeah although I, I was I only this morning I was writing to, and we were on my team and we we're going to deliver a workshop for a bunch of SMEs or subs and we were saying actually if I think back to what I need to do is focus because you speak to SMEs and they go oh well can you tell me all about social media how does social media work how can I use social media you're like, what, what, why, why, what do you want to use? I know. It's like, you know? what's the point if you don't? How like- do I, how do I sell on Twitter? I'm like, well, what, why are you selling on Twitter for? What? <laughs> you know, and maybe that's right. Maybe that's absolutely right for their brand, but it's, and, and one of the things I say is focus. Focus is so important. Yeah. And I was terrible for it because I'm like a kid in a sweet shop. I've got no attention span whatsoever. So I'm like, oh, Instagram's come out. I'll do that. Oh, so, and it helped me with digital marketing because no one else knew about it when I started. That's all them. No one else knew about digital marketing when I started. And I happened to have a bit of an advantage with for web developers before that. So I got it. Um, but I remember I was playing with social media because no one else really knew about it. And that was fine then because I almost had to do it in my spare time. Where it goes wrong is when someone joins a job and they try and do everything. Mm. No, and that, that 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 many hats thing, and I was guilty of it. Certainly, particularly in my first couple of marketing jobs, where I was going to go, oh, and I've got to do this, and I've got to do this, and I've got to do this, and go, hold on, let's just do three things really well. Yeah, you know, because you can't be really go with this. You can't be one thing well. You're going to have multiple things to do. But just what are your top three things to do just really, really well? Because that's the stuff your boss is going to care about. Yeah. Um, but the temptation to go, oh, and look, I've started a Twitter account. But now I don't have time to tweet because I'm, I've got to also manage my emails. Like, just leave the Twitter account. Yeah. Yeah. You know? It's um, sometimes you get a brief that's around like, oh, we need, we want to do more marketing. And actually what you often end up with is suggesting they do less marketing, <laughs> um, but much better and actually stuff that resonates with the audience. But it's so easy, isn't it? Like you say, when there's channels that are popping up all the time, and it's so easy for people to think like, oh, now I need to be on TikTok. And you just mm. think like, well, hang about. Like, don't you think you need to just check back to see if your audience is even on it? Um, yeah. But I agree completely. Anyway, that's the fun and games of it all. Um, the, the, only, the only final thing on the TikTok stuff is actually, you know, we didn't jump on it when it was out. But we, you know, we're on TV. And, and once you sub 25, you just don't watch TV, right? And, and and we've got and we've got a huge audience that is sub twenty five, and brand is so important when people are making decisions. Less so when you when you're younger, but still very, very important. That like we we can't put our brand in front of those people. But if you just go, hello fellow kids, and jump on 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 and TikTok, then that's not going to work either. So you have to find no. an organic way that really works. And so it, it it only happened once we had a good thing to say on there or good stuff to do on there or a good partner to work on there and that's only when we did it we didn't just try and get onto it tiktok because no because it's got to be content appropriate hasn't it it's like you know if it's if it's video based and it's about car insurance then you don't want to be there like oh watch this bang in crash you know it's yeah. like yeah I, well, I I totally... of brands have done stupid stuff like that and 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 barely survived it you know so and rightly they shouldn't no so yeah it, it, it'll happen organically. You've got to keep an aware of what's happening. Yeah. Work with agencies and partners and all those things if you can. Keep just but most of it, if you just follow Marketing Week and 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 search engine land and all those different sites and, and they'll tell you what's the new big thing, but they'll also be very pragmatic about it. Yeah. 
because they're all jaded marketers as well. So, <laughs> so they're, they're like, oh, what's this new rubbish? Um, but, yeah. Oh, brilliant. Um, I really wanted to ask you as well about your kind of approach to marketing in general, because um, you said before that you don't necessarily have a particular interest in insurance and that you pride yourself in your <laughs> ignorance of insurance and I love that so much and I have been thinking about it since but so explain what you mean by that and why you're so proud of your ignorance the biggest thing you can so so some of the big skills biggest skill set you can have in marketing I think is empathy empathy for your colleagues empathy for the people that you within the business absolutely because they just don't get marketing but I don't get pricing if I'm honest right so um, so empathy for their challenges, but primarily, of course, is empathy for the customer. And if you really, really know your product, and I don't mean the features and the benefits of the product, I mean, you're really deep in it. it. It's not that it's not valuable, but it's it's harder than to step back. So I try to look at things through the view of eyesight of the customer as much as possible. Now, every marketer says they do that, but actually they don't. And I, and and I and that's just fair enough as many times I haven't. You know, I, when's the last time you bought something on your own website? You know? Yeah. And, and when's the last time you, you you read through your whole email the so you got you got sent end to end? You know, I'm not proofreading, but as a customer, it's really hard to do. So that's why I try to avoid getting too much drink too much of the Kool-Aid, you know? I've got to know about my product because I've got to know that the the product that I'm marketing is marketing appropriately. You know, we have compliance teams and, and things to make sure that, that doesn't do that. Don't tell them it does that. It doesn't do that. So they'll make sure that that doesn't happen. But it's more that, um, does this product, even, does anyone even want this thing that you yeah. just created? And it's really easy to create a product. And that's where, you know, going back to design thinking, you start a customer problems, but if, but if you, the customer, or well, most of them, don't work an insurance company. So, they, they're not going to look at these problems the same way as you do. So you start with the customer problems and then you work from there. Whereas as opposed to you, if you think so much about your product and, and you obsess so much about your product, because you've got product managers to do that. Okay. If you obsess so much about your product, then you get enamored of it. And then it's very hard to sit objectively. Therefore, it's very hard to understand why it's useful to other people. Yeah. So you're like in an echo chamber of like, oh, I get it. So everyone does. Yeah. Yeah, I, my one of my best people to speak to is is my nine year old daughter. I was like, "We want to do this and this. Does that make sense to you?" She's like, "No." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but do you understand? It's really clever because we, if we do this and this, then like, oh, that means that those were things to together. It's like, no. I'm going okay. Scrap it. Scrap it. Because she's a smart kid. Guys, we need to pull this. <laughs> we need to pull this. We need to pull this. <laughs> What do you mean you've gone to the press? No, <laughs> Harry says no. Um, so, uh, yeah, so it, it's, it, it, so she's one of my best. Obviously, my wife's a brilliant sounding board as well. My, my in-laws, does this make sense to you? You know, and, 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 and anyone else. And of course, we, we do tons of insight. Insight yeah. is, is the secret source of everything. Uh, you know, you don't have to do really expensive insight. We, we do very big, quite expensive insight uh, pieces of work. But you can do it other ways if you're trying you're very careful to avoid bias that's really important so if you do if you are a small company and you do know your product in and out you can't help that and that's probably necessary when you're very small you're probably half a product designer um so therefore you have to try and just get it in front of people as much as possible uh and get honest opinions because yours are not that worth a bit worthless so on the subject of insights one of the things that I've seen you write about before or talk about um, was the humanizing data. Um, yeah. And I, I think, you know, it's quite interesting because you talked about it from the point of view of like, it's easier in an SME because you're closer to it. Mm. Um, but so that's quite a big project that you've tried to undertake at Admiral. Is that right? So it's not just me. I mean, you can imagine what data is for an insurance company. Yeah, it's right. Far, far bigger. You've got loads. Me. Yeah, too much. Um, so it's not. So I, to say it's my project is 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 not right. But but it, it is something. Obviously, I'm I'm the key stakeholder. So because 
In an insurance company, Admar and many other insurance companies, people are sorted by their policy. So almost they're as much known for the, the risk that they're protecting as opposed to the people they are. Right. That's not wrong. That's just the way that insurance is worked, especially depending on the systems you use and lots of other boring stuff. And whereas actually when you, if you're an SME or a B2B, you tend to know the person. You know, when I worked for a company that made software for brokers, there were only about 2,000 brokers that were our customers. So you could at least have bring up and speak to them and go, why are you using the old version of this? Why aren't you using the new version? I'm like, oh, because my computer doesn't work with it. And, you know, you can have a proper chat. About, yeah. You know, I love Google Analytics, but even Google Analytics, if you or any analytics tool, if you just obsess about the, the, the charts, you go, well, people go, why are customers just bouncing off that page? Why are they bouncing off the page? And, oh, I don't know. Well, maybe it's because this, maybe this. And then someone will go, either speak to a customer or go, well, couldn't we just put a what users do to that, which is like, you know, 20 quid to, to get, get some user testers to run through it and observe them doing it. And that's the equivalent these days of ringing up and going, well, tell me about your experience with the product. You can just you can do it a relatively less non-confrontational way, I suppose. But that is really important. So we are we're through a process of looking at our data and how we approach things like that. And that's the ultimate part of it is that I don't want to show the same stuff to every single person. I don't want to. I don't want to advertise the app to people who have the app, and and it's just basics, really. And mm. actually, smaller companies do it. Are more able to do it better, whereas big, big organisations, there's so many more things to do. Um, but every every big company is dealing with exactly same things from banks, particularly financial services, because we tend to be a little bit behind the curve compared to retail, for example. So is that a question that the tech? It's about investing in the the tech from a big company perspective obviously small companies probably can't afford to but that you know that personalization because that's not easy in itself is it you know you you have to exactly so if you are trying not to advertise the app to the people that have the app that's a tech issue yeah it's a tech issue primarily it's a data issue uh it's a priority I, priority issue. It's a business issue. It's the keeping the people who run the app happy. It's keeping the people who run the multi product happy because their band is not there. It's it's about it, it. Then becomes it's it's political. And Admiral's actually a very non political organization. It prides itself on it. You know, we're we're all in it together. You know, we're not like happy clappy. We've all got business goals to achieve. But 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 it, you know, it, it is it isn't about that but it is about okay well this has it i've got an objective for this thing but i've also got an objective for this thing so it's all about balancing these many huge objectives each with millions of pounds each um so i think that that's a tech issue it's a data issue it's not impossible but if you do it you it's going to be big so that means you're not doing something else yeah i see what you're saying you know? so to me it's the most important thing you could possibly do but to the next person it might be something about security Mm. You know, the next person it might be something about which is very important speed of the website you know the next person might be okay well we need to enable customers and this isn't accurate but to, to use paper you know and and uh, and so you've got all of the warm priorities and the bigger businesses the more strands are being pulled within an sme at least you can sit in a room with the businesses and go what do we want to do in which order yeah and there's only a few with them and people might disagree or whatever but you can it's just straight more straightforward uh so when you're going through some of the data, so what have you, do you try and relate it back to real people? So in it, like, so instead of it being just like X percent, you're trying to relate it to um, that it's a particular group that are behaving in a particular way because they have a particular need. Yeah. And I think, well, I, kn- I know that in a small, in an SME, you can, do a bit more of that customer segmentation, a bit more straightforward. Uh, It's harder in our company because an organization, because when you have 5 million customers, say almost 5 million customers, to go, well, uh, we're going to have four different customer groups, Jane, John, (laughs) Philip, and Judy, all right? And that means you've got a million and a half Judys. There aren't a million and a half people who are the same. You may as well be talking horoscopes. You know what I mean? So... 
I'd love so, if you segmented by horoscopes. Maybe we should. Maybe uh, give it a go, eh? Maybe all Taurians act a certain way. I mean, yeah. it's about as useful as that. Um, now, it doesn't mean you don't go, okay, these are people who prefer to interact uh, online. These are people who prefer to phone up. These are people who um, will always shop around. These are people who don't really like to shop around, but they feel like they should. You know, so you can do that. You can start to to go through those segments and follow those behaviors. And we do a lot of that. Uh, but there's always more to be done, loads more. Sure. Whereas in a smaller company, you go, okay, well, these are brokers that tend to be of a certain size. I keep using a B2B example. It's the one that impressed my mind at the moment. But these are brokers of a certain size. We know they tend to do all of the insurance for their customer. Or these are the ones that just tend to send their post to customer, the customer sorts it out themselves. And, and, and these need these services, but these need these services. So you can start to prioritize it that way. Uh, and it depends on the product, right? Like I said, I'm talking quite insurance-y, but when I was working for the University of Glamorgan, we would segment by uh, the sort of subjects that they were interested in. So, you know, people who took STEM type subjects, you know, they were going to be going into the sciences. Therefore, they needed to have a, a breadth of sciences and a brochure that reflected that. And, and you could segment that way. But then you go deeper, you go, OK, they're interested in the sciences and they're in their second year of university and um, they're probably going to be going for clearing and they're a bit worried, you know, or uh, they are interested in this and this. And maybe they won't get into this course, but this is a good backup course for that person. OK. You know, when the UniGlam is actually some of the most fantastic um, customer segmentation I've ever seen, so elaborate. Uh, and that was 10 years ago I worked there. Mm. Um, but they just there. really knew their audience. Yeah, because you have to, because it's high conversion. It's all about conversion. Um, yeah, really good, really, really good. But everywhere's good in different places. I mean, the Royal Mint, you could, I could go uh, tell me all people who like gold and the war, you know, <laughs> you know, and, and because they'd been segmented because they bought gold coins previously and they bought a Winston Churchill coin previously. And therefore they were all the gold war likers, you know? Um, and so, okay, we've got a coin coming up because of a new anniversary of a terrible thing that happened and send them that product, you know, or send them a brochure for that product. So even those were really good, but it, it was much easier to segment those than, than what we do now. But, you know, it, it, it's just challenging. And then, so in the same way when you're trying to um, attract a new audience, so, um, you know, in that example that you just used with the Royal Mint, um, you know, obviously that's where you're trying to then resell to an existing customer base. So when you're then, so whether or not it's how you do it at Admiral now or from previous times, so when you're then trying to find uh, a new audience, so you looking at um, needs, behaviours, and then thinking like, so we need to reach them in X, Y, Z way. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's sort of the, forgive me if I go a bit like basic, but I suppose it's the, the upper final stuff, isn't it? It's, it's fish where the fish are. So really at, at that point, say your product, they don't even know about your product. So you go the awareness route and you go, okay, well, you want awareness. Now you haven't got a budget to go smack a TV ad on. So which websites do they go to? Some of that's just straightforward, direct by display. You know, but display is hard to make work efficiently. Um, so, but if you are going to use display and upper funnel stuff, you need to have a little bit of a view of your attribution and know that you're not going to probably get any sales from a display, but it'll probably cause a search yeah. later on, or maybe it'll cause them to look at it on YouTube and then they'll go into search. And so luckily some of that is, is joined up. So you might, I mean, it, when you get to a big company, you tend to try, you might go a full stack of marketing technologies, or you might go the best and uh, best in market of each individual type of marketing technologies. But when you're an SME, you go, look, it's better if I buy everything from the same people. And they're, I'm prob they're probably biasing it in some way, Google, but it's worth, it's worth it for my ease, you know, yeah. to do the Fisher price of marketing technology because I can do everything and it's all joined up you know, in one ecosystem. So you know that the person that saw the display ad that you put out through DoubleClick also looked at it on YouTube and then did the search and then maybe responded on Gmail, you know, and rather than give Gmail the credit or the, the PPC search, it cost you a fortune mm. of credit, it's actually the display ad that did it. And, and 
if you're going to do multiple channels, you kind of have to get at least a, a view of your attribution. And you don't have to do it in some fancy science, data science way initially. You just use common sense. Mm. You know, just go, imagine you're a customer. Uh, what, you didn't wake up this morning and go, I'm going to buy a Churchill Coal coin. You know, oh, just tooth fairy put it in my head. You know, no one behaves like that. But it's amazing how people go, oh, I can see that the brand searches are the, the main driver of sales. So we should put all of our money into brand search. Mm. Like, I've had that serious conversation, not, not where I am now. I've had that conversation in a company years ago. And I was looking at their budget going, you put all your money into brand search. And they're going, yeah, but we find that we're not spending it all. So it's really efficient. I'm like, no, you're not spending it all because no one cares less about our brand because you didn't let them know about it anywhere else. So yeah. no one's searching for it. You know, but it's <gasps> quite hard to, to I know. fall into these traps, these self-fulfilling prophecies. And then you become very efficient very small i think it's a classic case where people are seeing a result and assuming it's the cause yeah correlation causation yeah yeah. and um i don't know i've had conversations with people before where they're like we don't want to do any marketing if it's not directly measurable and i'm like you're you're limiting yourself pretty severely um and you probably won't get a result you can you can get results I mean, I'm, I was one of those people, especially because I was a digital marketer. I was one of those guys that, you know, I, even, when I, even when I went to go compare, I was still an e-commerce digital marketing guy. And I was like, why you spend all that money on TV? Give it to me. Give it to me on PPC. And, we can make uh, it happen. I'll make it happen. Don't worry about it. I, you know, it wasn't even that long ago, I'm ashamed <laughs> to say, you know, in the grand scheme of things. Do we need to spend all that on TV? Do we need to do outdoor? Oh my God, outdoor? Kind of, who knows who's seen that? You know? And, um, and what you'd notice when they were off TV, say that they're saving money or they're trying to balance the books or maybe they're just doing a test. You notice, particularly a huge brand like that, a very high PPC, you know, spending tens of millions on PPC, tens of millions on TV. You notice very quickly when they stop doing that upper funnel stuff. Because suddenly it just gets harder, yeah, and harder to to re. Well, why aren't we getting the click through rate like we did? And uh, why aren't we getting as many brand searches? And therefore, our blended PPC costs have gone up. But I can't control it, and so my CPAs are becoming impalatable. So I have to pull back. And before you know it, you're circling the drain. It's mm-hmm. very, you know, it happens quickly. I've seen it happen in other companies. I've seen it happen in competitors anyway, and. I can see what they're doing here. They're trying to save money because they took the top of funnel stuff. But being realistic, when you're a new company, you, you can't spend money on TV, but you can get your brand up there. Mm. You know, there's lots of ways to get your brand up there without throwing money away. And uh, which, which are obvious, you know, upper funnel stuff, it's awareness. It's, you know, God, get out there. You know, go, go. If you're a small company, just meet people. That's mm. getting your brand up there. Uh, and, and all partnerships are huge for that, really valuable for that as well. I think the thing is with brand is um, I don't. I still come across people that don't really believe in brand, but mm. um, but love things like KPMG, and you're like, yeah, you love them because they're a brand. Um, mm. But um, if you invest in like a sales spike, that's fine, but it's gonna gonna taper pretty quickly. Whereas mm. you know. Brand investment's got longevity, hasn't it? It's like you you are building value. You just, you might not be able to directly measure it right now. Yeah, if you, I mean, exactly as you speak now, it, it, as you're saying, it's been it in fields, paper, the long and the short of it. That is the one that all major agencies love trotting at because they prove <laughs> the value of investing over a long period of time. And they did, you know, they, I mean, it's yeah. mathematical. In there. And, and, you know, don't get me wrong, there's lots of ways you can challenge it and they updated it and updated it and they've always looked at it and, and actually some of those channels like TV are reducing in their effectiveness and you've got to be aware of all these things. But what they basically showed that, and we and we started doing this, and this is one of my arguments in Admiral, it's like, I want to invest more on a positioning argument than a direct response thing. And that's what we did, but we did kind of a halfway house. But what you find is that, yeah, the first X amount that you spend is not going to be as effective as as a as a direct response bang get it out or a discount it's just not going to be 
Right? No. Why did I do that? I could have just saved money on discount. But every time your discount ends, you go back on square one. Mm-hmm. When you invest in the brand, you're maybe square two. Uh, but it's not as effective in that moment as if you've done that big discount. But the next, but if you continue to do it, square yeah. three, square two. But it, you've got to, you've got to be measuring it. Mm. You can't just go, well, it's okay. I'm, I'm not doing that because I'm investing in the brand. Uh, it comes <laughs> in three years' time. And we'll be at golden. You've got to, you've got to do the other stuff as well. Yeah. Try and make it as efficient as possible. But, but if you're not investing in the brand, you're just on a hamster wheel. Mm. And you're hijacking you know, yourself ultimately, aren't you? Like, where, what do you stop? Where do you stop the discounting if that's what you start with? Yeah. Well, that's it. You just devalue your brand before you've even built it. And yeah. It's a Sisyphean task. You know, you're just you're rolling a stone at the top of the hill and then next time, the, oh, we can't do the discount anymore or we're going to stop doing the discount. Oh, well, let's, okay, the roll stone rolls back down again. Yeah, yeah you've got to start from scratch. Yeah. And, and what happens is they do that and that's why companies flip marketing directors every two or three years because you go, oh, but we haven't gone anywhere. It's like, well, the poor marketing directors won't get any money to invest in the brand. <laughs> you go, well, yeah, I'm back where I was three years ago because we yeah. just, just didn't invest in the brand because you didn't want to do anything that wasn't measurable. Now, new companies, startup environment. Yeah, when, you, when you're really tight on money, you do do the quick stuff, the response. You get your float, as it were, you know? Start making some money, but it, it's, got, it's got a finite lid on it. So you yeah. do that, absolutely. And then that's why you need all the skills to be really efficient in your spend and because you need to get your float. But you can't live off that, not forever. No, and therefore you need to attach it to something that's short-term, like new product offer, not just yeah. like, Hey, it's Friday, 20% yeah. off. 20% off Fridays, yeah. Love 20% off Fridays. Yeah, it's no hard. one buys for the rest of the week. <laughs> I know, yeah. <laughs> yeah, great. Um, I, what I'm really interested about with your particular, so with Admiral, is how much are people coming to you direct versus how much are people going through um, like the Go Compare style marketplaces? Well, I... I could go into too much detail because you can imagine some of it's a bit sensitive. But yes, um, I didn't know if you'd even be prepared to answer the question. No, it's fine. It's it's. Um, I'd say generally, it's not. This isn't appropriate for our numbers, but I'd say sixty to seventy percent of the market shop. Yeah. Mm. So, so, but our, our numbers are different. But you you can find out anywhere. You know, that's a pretty common commonly known thing. So. Uh, and then the rest of it, but the dynamic, that's not how many people will, that's not how many sales are done through that channel because um, in insurance, a lot of people shop around but don't move. You know, yeah. you'll know it. I'm a classic. Always, you know, you go, oh, it's, I keep getting these emails from confused. Mm. I need to need to look at the price. I've gone on. Oh, it's about 20 quid more. But yeah, I'm the exact, if, as long as you don't put me up too much, I yeah. won't move. And if I have to then look back in five years time and be like, oh, that's quite a significant increase. That's fine. I'll do that. But I don't want to move year on year. Well, it's, it's going to be really, really interesting um, because the, you know if you're aware of the new FCA regulations with insurance. So what, what it basically means is you can't get a cheaper price at renewal uh, so you can't get a cheaper price at new business than you would get at renewal. So actually the regulations started now, but it won't kick in formally, like big time till beginning of January. So what that means is, say someone could get, uh, so say the same person at their renewal, it would cost 200 quid for car insurance. There's no way at new business they would be able to get that for less than 200 quid. Mm. So your price might go up, but considering if you, because of price comparison being such a dominant force in the market, yeah. and people tend to stay competitive. What used to happen is people in year two or year three, their price would creep up um, and that would happen. And then they go on price comparison. Of course, the new business prices are discounted. So they, yeah. they go, oh, well, it's much cheaper to go on the, this person. You know, and that wouldn't always happen. It depends on how much your price is going to buy. That's not really going to happen anymore because oh. there's not going to be a real impetus to go on price comparison. Because if you did, you're going to find your price as much as much as someone else. Now, there's always the chance that your risk is um, that insurer doesn't price your risk that risk very well. You know, maybe because that specific insurer has had loads of accidents in your area. Yeah, you know? there's always going to be individual pricing, but that whole creep up of price over time um, just in the industry just can't really happen anymore 
which is going to be really interesting. It changes the whole industry. What do you make of the direct line approach then when they've basically said no? Because I've always thought, God, I would not want to work in their marketing team because you would have to work your, you know, you said fish where the fish are. Yes, they they are, almost yeah. basically said, we're going to make ourselves desirable enough that the fish swim to us. Mm. And I just, uh, I think that must have been, it must have been really hard for them. Well, it, well Direct Line is a fascinating company. And, and there's, there's uh, I've got this full name now, a guy called Mark, who, who runs all the marketing stuff there. Obviously, a really talented guy. And, and the people before him, and X and Creatives, because they were, they were on the ropes years ago and they, and Price Comparison was, was he eating their lunch and also they, as a brand, they were starting to wane and, and this is from their own paper, um, 2014, something like that, maybe, maybe before. And um, what happened was they got creative and the creative really resonated. But if you bear in mind, Price Comparison is, it, it costs, uh, an insurer yeah. tens and tens and tens of millions of pounds. So they they spend on marketing. They spend gosh so much more on actual direct marketing than I do. I mean direct marketing, I mean TV. But their margin is tastier. Uh, yes, and and they've got the money that they didn't spend on price comparison as well. So they're not whatever that costs per customer. Mm. They're not losing that per customer that they acquire. Uh, they don't have to compare their prices to anyone else so they're not held up in that kind of thing. I'm not saying yeah. their price is competitive because people aren't idiots. I just mean they don't really have to have that within five pound of their competitors kind of thing. So they've got all of that going on and then excellent marketing and really sophisticated. And they probably invest a lot of those millions as well into their systems. And, stuff. So they've, and they've got really good marketers. So it's, God, it must be hard though. Yeah, it must be I really know. hard. <laughs> but they're called direct line. If you call yourself, if you, you're not direct anymore. You can't call yourself direct line. So it's a bit of a funny one, isn't it? You can't, yeah, you, they managed to get away with the fact it's not on a phone by, by killing off the phone, but you know, it, it, it doesn't really work. It's not it, how direct line the antithesis of direct line, I would have thought was to be go on by an intermediary, you know, I mean, uh, which is what they, they, cause of course they were supposed to be the alternative to brokers, which is why they were called direct line. So you didn't go to your broker. You just run a phone number to get your insurance, which is a revolutionary at the time. So, um, and then and then Elephant came along, which is obviously an Admiral brand, and they were the first ones you could really buy online. And that was, you know, Elephant was a bigger brand than Admiral for, for a long time. And, and um, so it's going to be an interesting one. I don't know what they do, how they deal with that, how, especially, but this might be a good time for them because of this whole change with the market. I was going to say, like, it's about to suddenly maybe settle in a way, but I mean, you're still in a position, aren't you, whereby... I can look at loads of different, on a comparison website, I can look at loads of different brands. Am I going to put in all my information all over again on somebody else's mm-hmm. website to then get a massive price? Yeah. The reality is, no, I'm not. And I have done it once and the price was so ludicrous, I will never do it again. But I just, I've always thought, God, they have, I get where they've done it. It's like when the Times started charging to use their website versus the Guardian not. Mm. But, Equally, what a situation. Interesting. Interesting Don't go there. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time. Um, it's been so great to chat to you and um, share your knowledge. And I feel like I've got more questions, so I'll probably bother you again in the future. I'm happy to do it again. No problem at all. <laughs> Thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed that episode of the Marketing Forum podcast. If you are not already, please do like and subscribe. And you can follow us on social media or subscribe to our mailing list to find out more about episodes coming your way soon.